Welcome to the Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. On today's episode of the Heal Podcast, I have Colleen and Jason Wachab. They are the founders and co-CEOs of Mind Body Green, and they are also also the co-authors of The Joy of Well-Being, A Practical Guide to a Happy, Healthy, and Long Life, something we are all striving for. A little bit about them both. Um, Colleen graduated from Stanford University with degrees in international relations and Spanish, which I wanted to say because I also graduated with a degree in Spanish, which is super random from (laughs) UCLA. Um, And she spent 10 years working at Fortune 500 companies, including Gap, Walmart, and Amazon. Jason is the host of the popular Mind Body Green podcast and the best-selling author of Wealth, How I Learned to Build a Life, Not a Resume. He has been featured in the New York Times, Entrepreneur, Forbes, Fast Company, Business Insider, and more. He has a BA in history from Columbia University, where he also played varsity basketball for four years, which makes sense because I think he's six foot seven, which is amazing. (laughs) Um, Colleen and Jason live in Miami with their daughters, Ellie and Grace, and we are here to talk about their new book, The Joy of Wellbeing, which I think is a total gift to humanity. Uh, So welcome to the show. Well, it's such an honor to be here and thank you so much for the kind words. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we are obviously so inundated with information now with social media and 24 hour news. And, you know, there's so many, as you call them, doc stars out there on Instagram, trying to make a name for themselves and wellness people. And it's just, it's, a, it's a loud, um, symphony of confusion, you know, that we have to sift through. And you guys have based, you know, because of your background in Mind Body Green and what you created there and the thousands of articles that you've, you know, uh, curated and and shared with the world, you you were in a unique position to kind of distill all that information down to, you know, the crux of what wellness our foundation should be. And that's all in this book. So do you want to tell us, you know, kind of a little bit about Mind Body Green if people don't know it, and then how it brought you to write this book today. Sure. So you're, you're hitting, a, there, there are a couple whys as to why we wrote The Joy of Wellbeing. And, and one of them has to do with the state of media and extremism. That, that's a big one. Uh, but if we were to rewind and talk about the why behind Mind Body Green, and our whys have evolved here too. Uh, I have to go back almost 14 years uh, I was running a startup. It was an organic chocolate chip cookie company that was in every Whole Foods market in the country. And we weren't doing so hot at the time. Uh, I was flying a lot. I flew over 100,000 miles domestic. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm six foot seven. Me in a coach <laughs> seat is not good for me or the person in front of me. Um, and it turned out, you know, that the flying, the stress, an old basketball injury from college led to two extruded discs in my lower back. I had excruciating sciatica. I couldn't walk. My, my right leg felt like a lightning rod. Uh, I tried cortisol shots. I went to a doctor. He said, you need surgery. I have nothing against surgery, but generally see it as a last resort. And the success rates with back surgery just aren't good. Sought a second opinion. That doctor said the same thing. And it was almost like an afterthought. He's like, you know, maybe some yoga or therapy could help you. And Colleen and I were dating at the time and she had a yoga practice. And I said, you know what, I'll, I'll try it. Let's see what happens. So started with some really light yoga, like 10 minutes in the morning and evening. Started to feel better. Over the course of six months, I completely healed. I went from couldn't walk to being totally fine. And to date, I've never had back surgery. But it was through that experience and yoga was played a significant role uh, I kind of had this awakening and it, it, it started to look at stress and sleep, diet. I was someone whose idea of a healthy diet was steak and martinis at the Palm Steakhouse. I consumed so much. My face is on the wall next to Adam Sandler and Joe Namath in Midtown Manhattan, <laughs> which is kind of insane. Kinda, I'm kind of uh, proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I look like at 27. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, my face is not as full as it was back then. It was all the alcohol. But uh, yeah. so any, like I still eat meat, not as much and, and, and so on, but. You know, and then started to look at our environment and chemicals and, and all these things and seeing how everything was connected and playing a role in our well-being. And I, I said, you know, look, everyone's got, if you rewind to 2008, 9, you know, wellness was equated with the spa. 
anything that was holistic was like really a little bit new agey and too out there uh, and felt like it was preaching in the choir of us lived in the west side of LA or Brooklyn or Boulder and that no one was really connecting the dots in a way that married Eastern and Western. And it was clear to me that true well-being was this blend of mental, physical, spiritual, emotional, and environmental well-being. And they were all connected. My buddy green, one word, not three. Back then, no one got the green part. I got a lot of why the green? I don't get it. I think today everyone understands that piece. And so that was the, the first why behind the founding of My Buddy Green. It started with content. We believe information is power. You have to educate if you want to make real change in the world and that then led to events and health coaching and supplements. And we do lots of things now. And and then this book. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's truly, and th this book is, is such a gem because uh, we can all admit that we're overwhelmed with information. Like you said, um, mind, body green obviously has been distilling it down and, and curating for a long time and the good stuff. And, you know, as you've mentioned before, you have a good BS nose meter so you're doing like a, a general layer of filtering, um, but then it's still just so overwhelming. We've got like biohacking and an extreme and we've got all the, you know, like you said, and we can touch on this for people to make a name for themselves and tap into the algorithm on social media, they have to be extreme. And, yes. and those extreme fad diets aren't going to get you, they might get you, you know, some metrics and some changing, but like longevity and, and yes. real lasting change and well-being is just a foundational thing where you've got to get the fundamentals down, which is what your book. Yes. Is and you're hitting on like two big whys. One is like how, how our why has evolved and then the, the why in terms of media. So like my why evolved from yoga to longevity. I'm 48. We have two little girls, age six and four. Men in my family have a terrible track record here. Father died of heart disease at 47. Two grandfathers passed away early. One, 44, cancer. The other, heart disease at 49. So like, I'm 48. This is stuff I really think about now. And what's so amazing in how the conversation has evolved over the past 14 years is the, the science is, is pretty strong. Like there are like a number of lifestyle modifications and interventions that people can, can use that can make a real difference with longevity. And if you think about, you know, the conversation went from, you know, lifespan, which is let's get you to a hundred to health span, which is, well, you want to be doing the things you want to do. You want to be healthy, fit, active. You want to be able, you know, for us pick up, you know, potentially a 30 pounder in your eighties, if we're lucky to bless to have grandchildren that requires strength. And we see the 3.0 is joy span you know, what's the point of living to a hundred if, okay, you're healthy and fit and you can pick things up, but like, what if you're miserable and like your kids don't like you and you have no friends. And I think like a lot of the conversation, you know, it's a big part of the book connection and purpose and meaning is like such a big part of why we're here on planet earth. Like that was a focus for us and like a big why behind the book, because the major objection with health and wellness, which we get is <clears throat> I don't have the time. I don't have the resources financially, or I don't know if it's going to work. And we totally get it. And we're in this business. But coming back to the science, there's so much pointing to practices that are low cost, no cost, require minimal effort and are, and are scientifically backed. And we're like, we can get you, you know, 80, we can get you like 80% there. So like, you can live a long, happy and healthy life. And we can do it if you don't, if you're busy, and you don't have a lot of time. And then uh, I'll segue to the the why behind the book, because you know, we're, we're a media company. We produce a lot of content, like why, why, the, why the page, why the physical book? And it's because the state of media, you know, there, there's this really unfortunate study that came out of the Wharton School in Pennsylvania, where they analyzed uh, the most emailed list, the New York Times. These are essentially the most widely read articles in the world. And they, they said, let's see if there's a pattern and we'll classify the articles by emotion. And there were three emotions that rose to the top, anxiety, awe, and anger. Anger was number one. Anger increased virality by 34%. In other words, if someone <laughs> were to write an article in the New York Times and it caused someone to be angry, that article is more likely to be read or viewed or watched and shared. That drives revenue. I don't think, we don't think, the New York Times is unique here. This is media extremes. If you th think about it, like, huh, what do I get hit with on Instagram? It's extreme points of view. And this isn't just 
a political conversation. This is a health and wellness conversation. Yeah, I mean, there was an intentional decision not to call the book The Joy of Wellness right now because we do see this cacophony of voices and it's super confusing to navigate and it's driven by these extremes. And when we think of the word wellness right now, what comes to mind is you know restriction, a little bit of militance, some protocols, and we wanna shift the conversation to well-being, which to us is more of a conversation around being mindful, intentional, and hopefully creating abundance in your life and less restriction. And you're right, like just the word wellness, it's like, there's like a finality to it or like, whereas well-being, it's, it's a state of being, it is a, it's a life, it's a energy, it's, a, it's an ongoing journey and unfolding rather than like getting to a goal of losing this amount of weight or, you know, having this amount of muscle or whatever. It's just, I love that. Um, and also that's just frightening about the virality being attached to anger because that's what we're seeing in the last since COVID, you know, this polarization. And then, you know, we watched, we kind of got educated by watching the social network and learning that they actually feed into your extreme, you know, fear and anger to hook your attention. Right. And that's, there's a study done at the most prominent business school in the country. Um, so obviously the people, the powers that be know this, um, and they're tapping into that, you know, and and so more and more people even lo- like, I love Dr. Joseph Mercola, but sometimes I like open my email. I'm like, I can't even read this. I'm, it's causing me so <laughs> much anxiety because he's just as extreme. You know what I mean? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, I can't, I have to protect myself from the content I consume, which is part of well-being, right? You've got to be really vigilant about what you're letting into your field and into your mind. Absolutely. I, you know, and we don't think that social media is going away, um, but the dangers of it, especially to, to children, but really to all humans is becoming so, so much more well known through, through work like the social network, through so many more, you know, studies and surveys that come out, which are frankly very disheartening, but you know, our optimism is that it will become so aware that we can't just give our kids social media and say, Hey, let's see what happens that, um, you know, by the time our girls come of age for it, that we'll understand it's like the same way you wouldn't give a child a drug. You wouldn't give a child social media because we just don't have the tools to, to leverage it properly. And we all have varying levels of addiction right now to social media. And in the same way, you wouldn't enter a room or open an email with people screaming at you Mm -hmm. um, and yelling back and forth. We don't want to put our brains in that situation, especially when we wake up first thing in the morning when we're not quite prepared for it. And if you think about it, if you're a creator and you know, every listener ask yourself the question of, okay, I could probably think of something very quickly. That's going to get a lot of people very angry. It's a little, it's a lot more difficult to think of something that what am I going to do? That's going to really create awe, inspire someone that takes a lot more time and effort. And that's what, that's where creators are faced with. Yeah, totally. And I'm, you know, also in cancel culture, I've been very conscious of like being diplomatic and welcoming all sides. So I'm not so polarizing with my opinion or like preaching or imposing my opinion and my knowing onto people. It's just like, okay, I feel very strongly about this position, but I'm going to leave room and be curious and compassionate about the other view, you know, and, and, but that takes a lot of energy, you know, it'd be easier for me to just be out there blasting my opinion on everybody. And I'd get like a lot of loyalty and fans and probably a lot more followers but like, I just, I can't, that doesn't feel good to me. That's not well-being. You know? Well, and, and what you're talking about is, you know, the tribalism that we've talked about in the media um, that we see playing out in the well-being slash wellness world. And there's a Harvard study uh, that actually showed that as people moved away from organized religion, they were putting the same fervor, the same passion, um, the same zealousness into their well-being practices, you know, and it's why when, you know, you can look at the movement disciplines and you have these tribes of I do CrossFit or I do Pilates and, you know, don't say that you're not getting everything you need from just doing one discipline. Um, and it's, it's become so rigid that people aren't open to new beliefs or even evolving as you go through the seasons of life and your body needs and requires different things to truly thrive. So one, one of the chapters in the book ends with, you know, the, the only thing to be um, rigid about is being flexible so that we're always open to new science. We're always open to welcoming changes that our body needs. Be water, my friend. I think <laughs> exactly. Briskly quote at the end. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll get into that because I, I really feel that like, you know, that 80%, 20% thing that you, you guys frame in the book where it's like with minimal resources or really, you know, just your body and your mind, 
Um, and like you can get to 80% of wellness and then you can always invest a little bit more and have a little bit more depth of knowledge and go on the biohacking route or the wellness spa route, or, you know, all the, all the fancy things, all the frosting, as you mentioned for, tw- you know, that extra 20%, but 80%, you're, you're feeling pretty good. If you're just doing the 80% fundamental things that you lay out in your book that anybody can access, it's fully accessible, you know, just simple things like breathing through your nose, um, getting sunlight, like early in the morning, as soon as you rise, like drinking your cup of coffee outside, and that taps into your circadian rhythms, all things that we, minor things we can do. Um, and your book teaches us how to do that, which I love. And, and so as I, my philosophy is also like 80%, 20% in my diet, like I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have joy in my life. If I'm a hundred percent rigid diet following whatever I'm going to eat, you know, 80% clean. I'm kind of a qualitarian. Um, I, I, I'm very intuitive. I, I just listen to my body and I've always had that knowing. Um, and, and if I don't have that knowing, or I'm being an unconscious and eating frozen yogurt and drinking cheap red wine and eating cereal for dinner, like I was doing in my twenties and had a heartburn, you know, <laughs> symptoms will wake me up to like make a change. Right. Um, so that's that like 80% have that foundational stuff and then enjoy 20%, you know, go out and like, have a hangover, you know, if, if that's your thing with, with your friends, like once in a blue moon, you know, that, yes. so you can enjoy that f- freedom or whatever your thing is like ice cream, pizza, whatever that thing is. So that's like, I love that 80%, 20% framework because, um, it just allows for like some grace and relaxation in life, you know? Yeah. yeah and, and look, we believe nutrition and exercise are foundational and, and you have to move, you have to eat clean, you have to eat right for your body that absolutely need to take that, take care of that. But we do think over the past couple of years, the space has become more rigid and in many ways, more exclusive and you have to have fun. And this hit home. It's like my favorite study, the Rosetto study. Rosetto was a small town in rural Pennsylvania in the 1950s. 1950s is when heart disease enters America, except for Rosetto. Men under 65 had half the rate of heart attacks of the rest of the nation under 55, non-existent. So they t- took a look, what's going on in Rosetto? This is amazing. Are they doing NAD drips? Are they doing CrossFit? Like, are they taking it? Like, no, they're not doing any of this stuff didn't exist. I'm joking, but like, they're not doing anything we would agree w- would be healthy. They're drinking, they're smoking, they're having tons of pasta and meatballs. Uh, and, and so they're like, this makes zero sense. And they take a closer look and they discover that the, this is like the most closely connected community on the planet. Multi-generational living is paramount there's context here. It's, it's, it's celebrating birthdays, it's parades, it's knocking on neighbors' doors, having them over for dinner. So it was all in the context of like, this community was so strong. And then in the 1960s, when the, when people start to move away and the community breaks up, heart disease catches up with the national average. And I think it's just, I think in our world, we spend so much time on nutrition and exercise and like the gadgets and and look like we like the things, you know, I've got, I'm wearing an aura whoop and we sleep in an eight mattress. So like, and we have a supplement business. I take a lot of supplement. Like we like all these things, but (laughs) you know what? You have to have fun. You have to have joy. And like, if you think about the loneliness epidemic, this is a real concern. Yeah, exactly. And the connection is so huge and and loneliness um, is the precursor. What we find loneliness and isolation, which is what happened in the last three years um, is the, is like a, one of the like fastest precursors to death, you know, and, and demise and, and depression and then, you know, mental health and physical health. So that human connection, that social connection, all the blue zones, there's such a, um, where people live the longest and are the happiest. They, you know, we, we underestimate how imperative social connection and ritual and celebration and, um, and, and support, you know, we're not meant to do this alone. So we've, I just interviewed Richard Schwartz, um, and he does, you know, the internal family systems. Family systems. Yeah. yeah. And, and he was just in his book, he, he just maps out why, we're, why, why there's 50% divorce in the country, you know, and markedly, like, I'm sure, the 50% that are staying married, like, you know, at least 60% of those people are miserable, you know? So they're like, so because we've isolated the family unit away from community and then, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, the husband and the wife are both working and they're just, there's none of that connection and ritual that is so essential for our health and our vitality. 
Yeah, there. You know, the, the the numbers are just terrible here. One in seven men have don't have a single friend. One in ten women don't have a single friend. Oof. Men are notoriously bad. Uh, my, I, I've, I, I have room for improvement here, to say the least, because men naturally just are, lose touch. And then if you look at like the health consequences, be there was a study out of BYU that came to the conclusion that being lonely was the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of like early, cause of early mortality. Mm-hmm. And it gets worse. It is four times as worse as having six drinks a day. That's 42 drinks a week. Uh, three times as worse as being physically inactive and twice as worse as being obese. Yeah. And we're seeing that it's definitely, um, kind of an epidemic in our society. Um, but yeah. And just real quick on that note, you guys have been married. You, you, you started a business together. You wrote a book together. You're doing a lot together. So there's connection. And then there's like doing a lot. What is the secret to your, you know, for being around each other that much, like what is, what are kind of some secrets that you've learned uh, how to balance connection, but like not suffocation? Well, Colleen drinks earlier in the day. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is it. We will, we will talk about that. Though. We'll talk about my that. girl, my girl. I, kind of one of the first things I always preface with is it's the dance that works for us, but I, I wouldn't recommend it for everyone. Um, you know, we are really tied by our value system. You know, when we talk about the pillars of the book, when we talk about pillars of mind, body, green, they're one in the same. Like we never have, you know, kind of disagreements about, you know, what is right for the direction of the brand. Like those types of things we're always so aligned on. Um, but what I, what I will say is I, I think we both have come to realize the importance of community, the importance of friendship, um, especially through the past three years. And um, our company is now a mostly remote company. Um, And we realized when we were going to the office every day and just looking at ourselves um, for quite some time as we wondered if our employees were going to come back to the office, um, that it was really important for us to find a community because work had been that de facto community and we didn't really have to give it much thought. It was just kind of there. We got to hang out with people who inspire us, people who have shared values and are passionate about the same things that we are. So when we made the decision to move to Miami, one of the things we were both very intentional about was was finding a community. And it caused us to do things that were completely outside of our comfort zone and being very intentional about making friends, which was something we hadn't done probably since college. And doing things that took us out of our comfort zone, like asking someone out on the first friend date, being maybe a little bit aggressive on, on exchange. And one of the wonderful dynamics that's happening in Miami right now is there's so many expats from other large cities who also are looking for their community. So there's a wonderful openness. Um, But typically, you know, when you put it out there, people are so flattered and so receptive to it um, that it, you know, creates that momentum where you want to keep on making more friends. And I think having, you know, that intentionality around the community is really important. And if you don't have one and you're looking for where to start, you know, I always think to go and recommend to go to the things in your life that give you joy. If there's a hobby, if there's a craft, if there's um, a wellness modality that you're really into, likely you're going to find more community, you know, around those same interests, those same values and those same passions. Yeah. And when you learn these statistics about loneliness and <laughs> early mortality and and ha- like, I can tell you, you know, I've always, my, my sisterhood connection recently, like once you learn how important it is to vitality, like, and well being and, and just joy in life, like, and, and how important it is to health. I mean, all these studies, the Rosetta study, everything, community and social connection literally saves lives. And so then you, you invest more, you make more of a conscious effort later in life to like go out of your comfort zone or try something new or get back into that thing that you left behind that brought you so much joy before you had kids or whatever it is. So <laughs> it's, it's such a huge, huge thing. And I'm, I'm investing more time um, with my girls these days, <laughs> new and old, you know, I have friends yeah. from, from first grade and kindergarten that we have the same group of girls that we're still friends with. And then I'm like pushing myself to make new friends with like valued and kind of minded people, which is really fulfilling. Um, re- I want to get into your, both your personal stories because um, obviously you're both very smart, driven, you've started businesses, you Forbes and all these amazing things. Um, but I think you both, well, you, especially Colleen, had a wake up call that kind of sent you on this trajectory. And I'd love for you to share that because I also think it's good for women um, to be aware of what kind of 
might have caused it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my hope for for all humans is is that they don't have to wait for that cosmic kick in the butt to start making change to their lives, which is why we start the book with, you know, how do you know when it's time to change your life? And I got a really big wake up call in that when I was in my early 30s, living in New York, working at Amazon, you know, kind of living that stereotypical life. And, you know, if you ask me at that point in time, what brought me joy, it was probably going out for margaritas after work. Um, And I had gone to my dear friend and godmother of our our second daughter, Grace's Saturday morning yoga class at Strala Yoga with Tara Stiles. And after class, I called Jason and was like, I'm feeling a little out of breath. Can you meet me in the city? And we walked around the West Village and after a short walk, you know, decided we need to go home. So we took the A train home and this particular station has very steep steps. So as I was climbing out of the station, I collapsed and then eventually got out of the station and we called my doctor and I did what so many women especially can do is, is that I gaslit my symptoms. I was like, that was no big deal. I'm dehydrated. It was a beautiful day in New York. I also had no desire to go to the ER on a beautiful day. Um, and I spent the rest of the week weekend just completely out of char- character, lethargic, napping, And come Monday morning, Jason said, the only way you're going to work is if you stop by your doctor's office on the way. And within a few minutes, he's like, you're having a pulmonary embolism. Um, Go straight to the NYU ER. And I was so bewildered. He gave me a little sign, said, I'm having a pulmonary embolism. Unclear if he didn't think I'd be able to communicate what was happening once I got there, if he was worried about me getting there. Um, But once I got there, there were showers of clots in my lungs. And I was really fortunate to to be alive. And it was a a long process when you are 32 and otherwise in seemingly good health and you have a PE, you know, there's a battery of tests that's happened. And I think what's important to note from a PSA standpoint is I didn't have any genetic predispositions for clotting. You know, they didn't really find anything in my blood work that was alarming. Uh, And the likely cause of my pulmonary embolism was being on birth control pills, which I had been on for about a decade without any issues. And I had done a very short flight to, ironically, Miami um, the week prior. And I remember when I was at my student health center in college, kind of getting um, on birth control pills, I took like a multiple choice test. And there was so many questions about not getting pregnant for proper usage and really a small amount of focus on kind of the risks. And I think I had heard of risks, but associated it with people who smoked, people who were significantly overweight and, and, and really minimized it in my brain. And I think I'm not as current on the statistics at the time. It was about one in 10,000 actually caught in the pill. But when I wrote an article on Mind Body Green that went viral, you know, I heard from so many women, sisters, cousins, aunts who had had a woman in their family or their community have a similar experience. So I, I do think it feels a lot more common um, than it actually um, shows in the data. And um, I'm not against pharmaceuticals, but I'm definitely more thoughtful about the ones that I, I put in and, and read all those side effects because um, every body is so unique and, you know, they're still discovering, you know, what actually can can make us all be susceptible and be vulnerable to some of these side, side effects. But it started this long healing journey, which was for me, a game of Marco Polo in the 2010s in New York, which was like a wellness Disneyland. There was no shortage of things to try. Um, And some of them were super fulfilling. And in others, I found kind of the underbelly of the wellness world. And, you know, I experienced the best of the best. And I experienced charlatan healers who were going through their own work and, you know, it manifesting in ways that, you know, they were taking advantage of a hugely vulnerable population when you're this edge case, who's on this healing journey and at, you know, your lowest point of self-esteem with your own relationship with your own health. Um, so a lot of the joy of well-being is kind of the roadmap I wish I had when I was trying to, you know, get back to baseline, get closer to that 80%, um, and have it have the actions I was taking yield a higher ROI faster. Yeah. And it's so important. <clears throat> like, I think that's why what I'm hearing from your story or what it's reminding me is that like our bodies are so resilient and, and, you know, I love that you like there's wake up calls at different volumes along the way. Right. And a lot of them you ignored until there was one that literally took you to the floor and you couldn't ignore it anymore. And then that, like Michael Beckwith calls it the cosmic two by four smacking you across the head. It starts with a little tap on the shoulder and then a whisper in the ear and it gets louder. And then it's like, bam, you know, and then you have a diagnosis. Um, And I really 
believe that if you just follow the fundamentals in the joy of well-being, which again are so accessible and it's something that everybody could do with just their tweaks in their routine, their lifestyle choices, their diet choices, their movement choices, um, and you know, getting back into social connection, just the fundamentals, you're putting yourself in the best, um, the highest resilience, even if you're just at that 80%. And you can always turn it up that extra 20 by investing more resources and time and doing the fancy things that you tried. Um, but if if we get to that 80% baseline of just like well-being and health and 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 foundation, like your body can handle so much. And hopefully you never get to that place where you get a cancer diagnosis or autoimmune. And and so I just know that so many people listening right now are dealing with a mystery illness or dealing with so many things that are trying to heal. And, and when you're on a healing journey, you, for sure, that's the time that you need to be rigid. But if you are just dealing with some symptoms or brain fog or some fatigue, like just th this book can reset you into that place of resilience. And a lot of your stuff might resolve on its own. And then you can like have a baseline where you have the clarity and the energy to actually make, you know, clear decisions of what your body needs to heal and resolve fully, whatever you're dealing with. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. That's good to hear because that's the, that's the message. And I think, you know, there is this idea sometimes in our space, and I think it's driven by media, like we're shooting for perfection. Yeah. And I've fallen victim here. You know, I went from, you know, I had this crazy marker of homocysteine, which is a marker of, of inflammation in the body. And if you have the MTHFR gene, which almost half the population does, you probably have a problem here. And that's like my PSA here, like get your homocysteine measured. Because homocysteine is homocysteine's inflammation in, in, in the cardiovascular system, and homocysteine at high levels could lead like lead to a blood clot, like a pulmonary embolism, like Colleen had, or a stroke. And so it's really serious. And I discovered in doing like basic blood work that I had sky high homocysteine, sixty three. Like so, it should be under fifteen. Like my doctor Frank Lipman thought it was a mistake. He was like, take it again. Uh, I took it again. It wasn't. And like, long story short, through supplementation, I got up to 10 and like, there was nothing you can do with lifestyle modification here. It's like, I'm not methylating B vitamins. And so, you know, for me after this, I became obsessed with, I was like doing blood testing once a quarter. And then finally, Frank said to me, he was like, what are you doing? Like, stop, like, just do it twice a year. Like you're, you're never going to get the perfect labs. And you know, it's like, you know, you're right. It's like, once you get perfect, there's so much we don't get, you know, I get hit by a bus. Mm -hmm. you know, it's never going to be perfect. Do it twice a year, understand your baseline and kind of move on. Otherwise it's just, it's way too much. Yeah, I know. And as obviously young parents, I have a four-year-old, you know, there's such a, like, as we've learned about this stuff for ourselves and we want to have, we want to set the health foundation for our kids and, you know, model for them and repair and like reparent ourselves and do all the things, but it's just so like, you can't be perfect. So like what it the last four years have taught me in complete overwhelm in this chaotic society we live in, that's a total circus in my eyes right now. Like just trying to survive is a, you know, just like forget thriving. I'm just trying to survive. And I have all the health right. resources in the world. So imagine, you know, my, my, I, I can't even, I'm trying to be honest here. Like it's still hard, you know, when I have support yeah. and so many people don't have support. And so what, like your daughter's name is Grace. My daughter's middle name is Grace. And that's just been like the thing, like as you're on a healing journey or a parenting journey, or even, you know, just making changes in your life, because there's so much change happening, you know, just energetically in the world right now is just remember like grace, which is why I love that Bruce Lee quote that you had, like, be like the water, you know, like you just have, that's like joy is, is fundamental. And then as you're trying to roll out this new way of being and make changes, like stay in grace with yourself and just like do the best you can. Yeah. And I think you have to, you know, just acknowledge what life stage you're at, you know, with two little kids on our end in a business, like this is not the time for my elaborate wellness routine. And when I move into my you know, later decades of life, sure, I look forward to hitting those hour and a half yoga classes again and, you know, enjoying more frosting. But like, now it's all about integration, finding ways where something is integrated into the day and not added as like another thing to do because I, I have such a complicated relationship with the word wellness because I found it unable at this life stage to be able to, um, you know, kind of 
do it in the way it's perceived on social media, which was another part of our intentional move to well-being, just because that word's gotten so hijacked. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the stuff that works the best is the fundamentals. And we got to bake the cake before we can put the frosting on. So how do we just talk about that stuff a little bit more? And the stuff that works the best is the stuff you enjoy doing. You know, I, I think that's that's a big part of the expectation problem. If you, you know, if you're like me, I, I hate running. If you see me running and call the police because I'm being chased, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. And I think we set expectations. You know, January 13th this year was National Quitters Day at the gym. Why? Because there's probably a lot of people who don't like going to the gym or they set unrealistic expectations that don't fit in with their lifestyle. Where I'm going to commit to, you know, going to go at 6 a.m. and to get two hours in and then. Next thing you know, like they have a child who didn't sleep the night and then it slides and it just doesn't fit with their life. And that's okay. There's enough out there. You can find the things that you enjoy and can actually really move the needle in terms of your health and well-being. Yes. I feel like I talk, you know, heal was kind of the one-on-one that woke up a lot of people to the potential and the possibility for healing and how their mind plays into it and not to give their power away to like listen to their instrument and their intuition and don't give their power away to a, a, a guy in a white coat, you know, just because they have credentials on the wall. It's like you, your body is trying to communicate with you what you need specifically. And it may or may not resonate with the doctor. Of course, seek the expert's help, but find the one that resonates with with your instrument, which is your super intelligent body. And I feel like the joy of well-being, your book is kind of, it's the 101, but it's like, it's like a lifeline for people because for instance, <clears throat> you know, I have books upon books upon books. I've got to read books for every podcast I do. I love reading, but I also have a four-year-old. Like I don't have that much time. Like that's kind of the thing like I do for survival. I'm usually cramming the night before a podcast. Um, and so I've had that book breath or breathe by James Nestor. Great book. Yeah. I have two copies like in my bedside table. And it's just like piles of books that I want to read, but I haven't had time. And so in the, in your chapter about breath, you kind of like cliff notes, like, you know, all of these amazing, like you've distilled it down of what we need to know to be healthy and feel good and live long. And I appreciate that so much because you take little snippets from all these books that I haven't had a chance to read yet. <laughs> and so for instance, like, and again, I know so much, but tennis has been my like reconnection with joy and and movement. And I'm really into it lately. I do it as much as I can. And so yesterday while I was playing, um, I was breathing just in, in and out through my nose. And I was aware that I catch myself like, you know, I breathe in through my nose, but I breathe out through my mouth. Or if I got really breathy, it'd be like mouth breathing. And just the, you know, what you taught about the breath and through the nose and how it's a filter and how your performance goes up and your oxygenation and all the things. If you're solely breathing through the nose, I was sitting there consciously retraining my body to breathe through my nose only. And I was like, this is just one little tweak and it's probably going to change my life, my game and everything, you know, and that's what this book is filled with. Um, so Thank I appreciate you, you doing the work for us to make it <laughs> simple, to make these tweaks. Yeah. Well, that, and bre breath is a, you know, hugely personal chapter for me because coming off of a pulmonary embolism, it was the first time I actually thought about my breath. And I remember being on the New York subway and, you know, kind of not trying to make eye contact with senior citizens because I'd be fighting them for the last seat because it was so hard to breathe on a crowded train in the summertime. And kind of through this process, you know, really learned about the breath. And when, we were at certain life stages. We had, we've tried all forms of meditation and breath work, and we could do that 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon. And it's just not realistic or effective for us at this life stage. And that's why, you know, if you don't know where to start, we always suggest nostril breathing because, you know, you met, you called out some of the amazing health benefits, but for me as someone who always runs a little bit higher in anxiety than I would like, it also activates the parasympathetic nervous system. So you're going into this rest and digest mode and it helps us be a better listener. It helps us be a better partner because you're literally have to wait and can't kind of interject with your point or do those things that, you know, perhaps some of us are working on like myself um, <laughs> and, and creates that inner sense of calm and you're doing it 17 to 30,000 times a day. So it's such a good place to start. There's great ROI. You're doing it anyway. If you don't do it for too long, you're probably not going to be with us. So you might as well get it right. The downstream effects are just overwhelming. And, you know, to your earlier question is how we work together. I, I, I think part of our success in marriage and working together is I've become a better nasal breather. When Colleen's talking, I close my mouth and breathe through my nose. I think that's good advice for any marriage. It goes hand in hand with listening.
<laughs> yes. listening skills. Close that mouth. Um, talk to me. One of my favorite parts of the book was the um, spirituality section because kind of my ultimate conclusion with heal was that all healing is spiritual healing ultimately. And, um, and you have this amazing kind of part about spirituality and uh, the, the relationship between the mother and the child and, and what it protects against. Can you talk about that? Cause I just like, it resonated so deeply. Like you, sh- you haven't had Lisa on your show, have you? No. Oh, you got to have Lisa Miller. She's another Miami resident. Uh, okay. Amazing. Everyone should just move to Miami. I think so. Uh, apparently. So Dr. Lisa Miller is an amazing human being. She's a PhD. Uh, she runs an incredible program at Columbia and she's like the authority on the science of spirituality. Uh, she has a tremendous book, The Awakened Brain. And, you know, it's an extensive work on the science of spirituality, specifically around the, the role of, of children. And, I, and we, we say care, caregiver, uh, and, you know, if you think about the mental health, health epidemic with children specifically, uh, I try, I don't try to memorize these numbers because they're so startling as a parent, especially the ones around girls, like 60% of girls are like in very bad shape mentally, but so that's why I don't, the other numbers I'm sharp on this one, I try to forget, but I remember Lisa's study because mm-hmm. as you think about the mental health crisis, the power of spirituality is something I think we should all be spending so much time on. You know, what she found was that when mother and child were quote unquote high in spirituality, and she has a very broad definition of spirituality, it could be organized religion, attending church, but it could also be, you know, walking in the woods, volunteering, uh, you know, meditating. It's this idea of like having a capacity for transcendent awareness, a transcendent relationship, this idea that there's something bigger than oneself. When that is high in, in parent and child, the child is 80% protected against depression. In other words, five times less likely to experience depression. That is powerful. And you have to, you know, for people listening out there, like you have to then deduce that the mother also is protected against, right? So any human with that kind of, and it doesn't, you know, there's multiple ways. I mean, like you said, you could be, you know, your religion could be nature. Your, but to believe in some higher intelligence that is not anthropomorphic, but is, you know, keeps the planets like in, you know, the laws of the universe and it, everything in, even amidst the chaos, everything is in harmony. Um, right. So, you know, like, nature is constantly healing and regenerating itself. And we're doing a really good job of, of, of destruction and getting in the way of that process. But ultimately you have to believe that nature wins, right? Humans have come and gone many times and we're going to do that again to ourselves, but nature will thrive because it's the laws of nature will destruct to regenerate, you know? So what do yes. you, what do you, what do you, and I think for for further clarification, she found that it was the biggest protective factor over the course of an entire lifetime. So like, it wasn't like the kid with your child was just going to be good through, you know, the awkward teenage years, like this was forever. Yeah. And a super generous definition of spirituality. Sure. It could be religion. It could be prayer. It could be a walk in the woods, volunteering, picking up trash, um, really just believing in this belief that there's something bigger than ourselves out there. Yeah. And it could be based in science, you know, there's like quantum physics and entanglement and I, I, to me, I feel like science is kind of starting to be able to demonstrate spirituality in a way. Um, so for all, yes. you know, those kind of critical thinkers or science based people out there, there's room for spirituality as well, you know, and I think science is demonstrating that. So 100%. Um, I was really, uh, you know, kind of, I admired you, Jason, kind of sharing and being vulnerable about your personal story and your kind of um, experience. And you shared it. I don't know if you want to share it here or like a touch sure. on it or save it for people to read in the sure. book. But I just wanted sure. to, you know, like really applaud you for sharing because that for a man to do that and a man and kind of a CEO role and, and a, an entrepreneur and businessman like that was just really I was really proud of you for for sharing that. Sure. Well, well, thank you. Well, the the, the big why here is men are forty percent of fertility issues. 
Uh, yes, we were an edge case, so to speak, very unique, but I played a significant role. And, you know, we are blessed today. There's a, there's a happy ending. We have two beautiful children, uh, but it, it was a journey. And, you know, we had tried getting pregnant and nothing was working. And, you know, we had done some transfers and they forgot about me. And then they they tested me and I had this or I have this condition as do spermia where essentially the no sperm was was coming out. And it's like, this is interesting. <laughs> this is this. And so there, there are two ways this can happen. One is there, there's something genetic. They didn't think I didn't have the genes for this. Uh, or like where I would have like, but there was a chance I just didn't produce sperm at all. And the other situation, once we found out the one we were hoping for, that there was a blockage somewhere that something was blocking the sperm. And that there was there was a test that they had me do, which was a, an, inv an invasive test that was very uncomfortable where most of the blockages would occur. My blockage wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And so the the only hope that the, was the blockage was, I'd say, lower funnel. Uh, okay. And that would require a surgery. And so we we were working with a fertility clinic and they had someone who specialized in the surgery and he flew up every month from St. Louis. And this was, this was tough for a variety of reasons. One of which is, you know, we do believe in having a strong connection with your healer and like feeling that. And this was like completely the opposite. We sat down and I'll never forget. It was like an early Saturday morning at 8 a.m. He's already, you know, drinking his Pepsi or diet Pepsi. Uh, <laughs> right away, he launches into, I hope this works because if it doesn't, adopting is a terrible option. All the kids have problems. And like, these are things we just do not believe in. And it was also a real possibility for us that this didn't work, you know, really. Hope, and I'm just like, oh my God, this is the person who's literally going to put me on a table, give me some local anesthesia and cut my testicle open to oh. see if there's sperm. And then he was like, let's go. And this was the only option and the person. And I went in and sure enough, I had loads of sperm, 12 vials of sperm. And, and <clears throat> to this day, we, I'm, I am a medical mystery. Uh, I, after our first child, I went back or se second child, I went back to like, cause it's still in the back of my mind. Like what's really going on? Like if no one really knows where the blockages are. And this was, <laughs> I got the answer from, from the doctors. Why do you care? Like you have two healthy children, you've got like, what's the point? I was like, you know what? You're probably right. I'm just going to let it go. And I think it's a good message for me. Sometimes things happen in life, whether there's a happy ending or a sad ending and you just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so we thought like, okay, amazing. We've got Jason, we got 12 vials of sperm. It's go time. And unfortunately, like that was just getting yeah, that to was the just starting just line. Start. <laughs> and, you know, when you do have a partner with azuspermia, the only way to get pregnant is through IVF. And we thought it would be a really easy journey. I had, you know, good fertility scores as they call it, but it was really just the start of another emotional Three marathon years. of, you know, a total of nine IVF transfers mm. and 15 embryos transferred to get to our first daughter. Um, and, uh, you know, it's such, it was just one of those unexpected, like longer path than we anticipated. And again, like no one really knew why, you know, they, they could never quite understand why the embryos weren't sticking or why, you know, there were some issues with my lining on certain occasions. And, you know, definitely one of those hardest moments of the soul that kind of like tests you. And I think when I look at all the things that have happened, particularly over the past three years in the world, it's like the hardest things are never the ones that you're anticipating. They just kind of come at you <laughs> regardless of whether you're ready or not. And building, you know, the emotional resilience to weather the inevitable ups and downs is, is critical, not just to survive and, and thrive, hopefully as humans, but also as we think of our two young girls and kind of the challenges, you know, that they're going to have in life is how do we build humans who have these abilities and the resilience? Because life's hard. It's always going to be hard and you're not going to be able to anticipate it. And there was a lot of faith. There was a lot of resilience. It was a lot of endurance. It was tough on our marriage, but we ultimately got through it and we we feel like we passed through this phase together. It was also, I think, a big takeaway for us. Uh, you know, 
in our view, we like it's time we had to be CEOs of our own health. We saw Eastern, we saw Western, we saw people who were incredibly flawed on both sides. I remember seeing one Eastern healer who was convinced I just had to castor oil my way out of this. <laughs> and I'm just like, and I and I would try it. And I was so open to anything. I've seen so many crazy, you know, out there things. I was totally open to it. And in retrospect, I'm like, this guy was just crazy. Like, how much did I spend on castor oil? Like he knew nothing of like what was and in the Western on both sides. And I think it's important to remember that we're all dealing with humans. They may have the best intentions, but they're all going through stuff. Mm -hmm. Some of them may have their own, you know, God complexes and yeah. think they can do anything. And I think like what, one of our passions is like help, be, help, help people become the, their own CEOs, their own health so that they can, you know, understand to their body and yeah. confidently navigate these challenging times. Yeah. And remember like that perspective of, knowing that is as is, is amazing as like this human is at one particular kind of expertise in their life, like they're also flawed and human and they're looking, everything is filtered through their lens of their life experiences and right. childhood trauma and anything that they're like going through. So just, and that's like, that's such a huge thing. And we tried to kind of express that and heal is to tap into your own intuition and, and, you know, which is why practices like prayer and meditation and silence and walking in nature so that you're, you can reconnect with yourself and hear those hear you know, and discern what your, what's your voice and your resonance and your higher self guiding you, um, so that you can like, like come up, you know, you, you, you did not resonate with that doctor that found the blockage, but at that point you're just like, okay, look, he's doing, he, He's obviously a shitty bedside manner, but he's probably pretty yeah. good at what he does. Yeah, he, he's and the he, guy. Like, he's the there guy. was no alternative. There was no <laughs> alternative, so we got to do it. But like, for people, you know, it's just so important when you find your healers and your team of doctors that you do resonate and they do feel. Because also, I'd love to ask you, Colleen, <clears throat> as we're just wrapping up this story, like, is there anything that stuck out to you or anything? Was it a moment of surrender or perhaps like a shift in... Uh, mindset or something that like made the difference between the nine transfers and the ones that worked? Unfortunately not, but um, <laughs> you saw, if you saw how big our I, first honor was, you, you would say. Um, <laughs> you know, th this idea of finding your healer, like we, we realized that it would be a longer journey than anticipated. And within New York, there's lots of different people who can do egg retrievals and can do transfers. And for me, it was finding the person that believed in myself believed in me that wanted me to get pregnant almost as much as Jason and I, because we knew that this was going to be a long journey. And some of the best quote unquote doctors in New York, um, you know, it, here's how we're doing it. Here's how it works, take it or leave it. And they're not open to having someone, you know, with questions with perhaps a different POV to how to navigate this journey. So I found someone who I felt was truly going to be my co-pilot on this journey. And, you know, you are such a vulnerable population when you are a woman or a partner of family who's going through this. And I think that's so important that there are some large clinics in my experience in New York, where literally if someone's telling you a transfer didn't work and you're not pregnant, like they're reading like a script. And I understand how that happens when you try to, you know, scale emotional humanity at someone's darkest moment. Um, but when you're on a long haul journey, you know, I really needed that personal touch. And so we went with someone who was so much smaller and perhaps less well-known than some of the prestigious clinics. And, you know, I, I have such a place in my heart for Dr. Amir Azim. And we, unfortunately, between our first and second um, pregnancies, he actually passed away from lung cancer. And when I think of like the emotional kind of burden that he was going through every day, you know, <laughs> with me and other women, when he sees the highs and lows and, you know, we had no knowledge that he is a father um, of two was, you know, going through his own cancer journey. And, yeah. um, you know, so his, he was in partnership um, with his wife who actually uh, delivered our second baby. And what was interesting was, you know, the night before my, the transfer of our second daughter, Grace, um, you know, I, I told Jason, I didn't sleep well. I was like, we're going to get pregnant. I don't, I don't think I could handle twins right now. You saw a woman with twins. I, I saw a woman in twins was... in New York and it was a bit unwieldy. And I was like, I, I don't think that's my path. Um, so I, uh, called the clinic first thing in the morning and I was like, please just transfer one. 
Um, we'd actually transferred four to get to Ellie. Don't hate on me. It's very unusual. But when you when you see the chart, <laughs> it makes sense. Only one of them survived, which is our 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 very strong, tall daughter, Ellie. And so when we only transferred one to get to Grace, um, who they were a bit befuddled, and that one worked magically. But I think what was interesting about this journey is that if at any point in time someone had said to me, there's a problem, this doesn't work, this is you know, not going to happen, I'm a really rational person. I would have said, okay, l- let's stop this self-torture. Let's stop hurting myself and this you know, roller coaster of monthly ups and downs, which was quite unbearable. And it's almost harder when you don't have that diagnosis because there was no reason in my mind to stop until there was a reason why I couldn't, uh, you know, continue on the journey. So I think that's actually what made it the hardest at a certain point, I did just have to surrender. And I think for so many women who are going through this, it's, it's not the physical pain. It's not the injections, the hormones feeling out of your body. It's the emotional roller coaster that you can't control of literally getting the worst news of your life mm. every month. <laughs> that's so hard. Um, and that's, you know, the burden that I don't think I fully healed from because you go from this roller coaster to then becoming a mother where, you, you know, your, your time and, you know, you're, you're, you're now caring for another human and you don't have as much time for yourself to being pregnant again. And I don't think it was till the pandemic that I could fully process when I had more downtime, what my body had gone through and, you know, the micro traumas that had accumulated through this very arduous process. Oh my gosh. I, you should get a medal of honor as should all of the <laughs> women that have gone through this because I just finished, I'm 44. And I, in January, I was like, I don't know that I am done having kids and, you know, not to get too personal and not to make anyone feel weird, but my husband is older and he's got five other kids and we have a beautiful daughter together and he's pretty sure, you know, he's like, he's done, he's done having kids, but I'm like, I'm a woman. I have this feeling. I just need to put some eggs on ice. I'm 44. So people are like, you're putting 44 year old eggs on ice, you know, but that's what I'm doing. So just last month, Um, I went through the egg retrieval process and it's like, you know, it is that like, you know, at 44, I'm expecting bad news. And of course I know I'm biologically a little younger than I I am because I've taken fairly good care of myself in the last few years. But, um, you know, there was just, it was a roller coaster of like her telling, like me having expectations and, and, um, and then the hormones and like, just even your, your history of a, pulmonary embolism and then they're pumping hormones into you that the number one risk is clots like I can't even imagine that anxiety that you were navigating you know like even yeah, I, even I, I don't it. yeah I don't yeah. I wasn't on the about the clotting yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like when you're you know <laughs> like you would be like oh my ankle's swollen you know should I go to the hospital or is this just swollen because it's New York and obviously with my history there was a couple of false trips to the hospital <laughs> oh, no it's so like I was I was anxious and I, you know I stopped taking the pill long ago because I would miss a pill and be like suicidal I was like this is not <laughs> good in my body I don't think I should be taking this Um, but you know, like she was like, okay, estrogen, like here's all this list of clots and like, what the hell? Like, I haven't put this in my body. And anyways, all of that to say, you know, she suggested at my age that I do two more rounds, you know, it was was successful. I got seven eggs out, you know, they can't test like how great they are until they become embryos. But I was just like, my body is telling me it's one and done. Like I did my, that's what I want to do. And until, you know, I need to go through that thing. But like, if your why is strong, it's going to lead you. I'll do more if I have to. But right now it's just like, I did what I needed to do. But my why of, I am a woman, this is my life. Like I may want to have more children, um, got me through that painful process in the last six weeks, you know, and you it got you through nine rounds, but thank God you had the space and the time finally to process that and release, you know, and because it is such a heavy journey and I'm so glad it ended happily for you guys. It is. It's brutal. And I think in our world, even though it's becoming a little bit more commonly accepted, we don't talk about it. And there tends to be sometimes in our space in the extremes, uh, a little bit of shame or guilt or, you know, why it didn't happen naturally or, you know, oh, you're giving birth in a hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was always the reality. Colleen was high risk. But I, I do think, look, it, it's 
it, it's a real issue and it's extraordinarily difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both for sharing that because it is so vulnerable on both sides. Um, <laughs> is there anything else before we wrap that you want to say about this book or your life or anything to share? I think, you know, for us, just for everyone to keep in mind that this is a journey. And what we found is there, there are seasons in that journey and your body changes and your needs change. You know, it certainly happened in twenties, thirties, and now me in my late forties, like my needs, my modalities, everything has changed. And, you know, I'll echo the Bruce, the Bruce Lee quote, like be, be open, be water, uh, be empathetic, be curious. Uh, there's so much great science out there. There are so many great leaders in this space and it's constantly evolving. And we hope that, you know, the book will get you 80% there and that you can take the rest and, and run with it and evolve as the science changes. I love it. Totally. Well, thank you um, for the, the joy of well-being. Anybody who needs, who thinks they know a lot, but is overwhelmed and wants to distill it down to the basic fundamentals um, and things that you can do every day, like these tiny shifts, because I, I do feel like I know a lot, but this book just really just said, okay, wow, I can do this in the morning. Like sleep to me is like so important. And what I saw in the process of freezing my eggs or, or retrieving my eggs is I had to give up caffeine and alcohol, two things that, you know, kind of a pretty regular staple in my life. Not <laughs> proud of it, but it is. Um, and, and so, and it was easy to give up both when your why is so strong. Right. And right. I found myself sleeping so deep and feeling so much better. So that was the gift along the journey. Um, but this book just with diet, with sleep, with breathing, with movement, with connection, like you just give us the cake of what we need to have, you know, to feel good and to truly, um, you know, be joyous and, and, and feel, feel good and feel healthy and, and build resilience in life. So thank you for curating this and putting this together. Um, and I encourage all of the listeners to pick it up because it's just, it's, it's like a must, a must have in your, in your repertoire. Well, thank you so much. You're very kind. Where can uh, people find you guys? Sure. So they could go to thejoyofwellbeing.com or the books on Amazon or every major book retailer. And you could find us at Colleen Wachab or at Jason Wachab on social media. And then all things My Buddy Green, our podcast or .com, our products, we're, we're kind of everywhere. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gore. Thank you so much and be well.